Welcome back students, we're in week five. This week we're gonna discover viruses, variants, and vaccines. This is super exciting. There are several videos, but they're short and easy to digest. Let's get to it. Welcome back. Dr. G here again to chat with you about viruses, variants, and vaccines. Nice alliteration, huh? In our quest for understanding COVID-19, we must explore the basics of viruses. After all, COVID-19 is caused by a virus. So what is a virus? Are they alive? Is there just one kind of virus? Is there more than one kind of virus? And if so, how do they differ? I'll never forget the simple definition of a virus given by my introductory biology textbook many, many years ago. Neil Campbell and Jane Reese's textbook, Biology, define viruses as obligate intracellular parasites. Now, while I suspect that this definition isn't uniquely theirs, it has nevertheless stuck with me over the years because it's, it's brief, it's easy to remember and packed full of information that helped me understand the basics of viruses. So let's unpack that definition and discover the fascinating world of viruses. So, obligate intracellular parasite. Let's break that down. Obligate, well, that means obligated to, or required to, or necessary, or mandatory. I don't know, plug it into a thesaurus. You'll see many other uh, ways to describe it. In other words, viruses are obligated to do something, right? Good. All right. So that's obligate is, is checked off. Intracellular. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. That means that viruses must be contained inside of a cell. All right. I think we've got that check mark. Now a parasite, we've all heard this term and used it many times, but do we really know what a parasite is? Well, a parasite is something that benefits at the expense of its host. All right, so let's put all this back together into kind of a, a long sentence. A virus is an organism that is obligated to exist inside the cell of another organism or a host where it uses that host's resources to benefit itself. So would you agree that Campbell and Reese's three word definition provided us with a ton of information? I would. So <laughs> let's, let's talk about the next question that we had, right? So that's, are viruses alive? Well, no, they're not. Viruses are not alive. They're basically packets of nucleic acid. Well, why did I use the term nucleic acid? Well, more on that in a bit. Viruses can only reproduce within a host because they lack the machinery to re reproduce themselves if they're isolated. So in other words, no host, no virus. So how many different kinds of viruses are there? Well, let's start off by lumping viruses into two main categories. And here's why I used the term or the words nucleic acid before. Viruses can either be DNA viruses. Again, DNA means deoxyribonucleic acid. So they can be DNA viruses or they can be ribonucleic acid viruses or RNA viruses. Now, to differentiate virus class further, both DNA and RNA viruses can either be single-stranded, I'm sorry, single-stranded, or double-stranded. Now, once we have those bases covered, then there's some additional classes or families that viruses can fall in, but, you know, we'll, we'll attack those as we need to. So, let's talk a little bit about virus structure, okay? In a similar way that different bacteria have different shapes, so do viruses. For example, some viruses are rod-shaped. Some are spherical with 
protruding spikes, kind of like a coronavirus, for example. Some are polyhedral in that they have many flat sides. Uh, there's also a type of virus that reminds me a lot of the Apollo Lunar Lander. Remember back in the 60s? That's actually called a bacteriophage, and I think you might agree it looks a lot like the Apollo Lunar Lander. Now, in addition to their appearance, each of these viruses possesses different properties. In fact, viruses are shaped in a certain way to improve their chances of replicating. So in other words, form equals function. Now, let's get a little more specific. What kind of virus is SARS-CoV-2 and how does it compare to other viruses? SARS-CoV-2 is in the class of single-stranded RNA, or SSRNA for short. Uh, SSRNA viruses, right? So in other words, instead of the genetic blueprint being DNA like we've discussed, the virus that causes COVID-19 has an RNA blueprint. And so if you've already watched my video on the central dogma of biology, you'll note that SSRNA functionally serves as messenger RNA or mRNA. Now, mRNA will become very important again when we discuss the COVID-19 vaccine here in a bit. So examples of other SSRNA viruses include um, flavivirus, which is the cause for West Nile virus, and togavirus, which is the cause for rubella. So if you've ever had the MMR shot, measles, mumps, and, mumps, and rubella, uh, that's caused by togavirus. Um, some examples of double-stranded DNA viruses are pox virus and herpes virus. Now, pox virus is the virus that causes smallpox, and herpes virus, well, is the virus that causes herpes, uh, specifically herpes simplex 1 and herpes simplex 2. Another example of a herpes virus is the Epstein-Barr virus, which is commonly referred to in, in disease terms as mononucleosis, or colloquially just mono, right? So, how do viruses infect their host? For the purposes of this conversation, we're going to specifically talk about human hosts, but know this, viruses can infect other animals and viruses can infect plants too. So remember that part I mentioned about viruses using the quote unquote machinery of their hosts? Well, while some viruses do, there are some viruses that don't have the enzymes or polymerases that we discuss that are needed to catalyze the polymerization of mRNA or polypeptides, which are, as you know, the precursors of proteins. Also, viruses don't have ribozyme, uh, I'm sorry, ribosomes um, or other components that are part of a cell's protein synthesizing machinery. That's where the parasite part comes in for obligate intracellular parasite. Viruses use the protein-making factory inside our cells to replicate. So you may be wondering, can viruses integrate themselves in our DNA? Yes, some can, not all, but some viruses can integrate themselves into our DNA. For example, one DNA virus that can do this quite well is the herpes virus. Now, by strict definition, RNA viruses cannot integrate themselves into the host, human for our purposes again. Now, retroviruses, which are a type of specialized RNA virus, can integrate themselves into our DNA. You may know this as an example, but, but an example of a retrovirus that can do this is HIV. Now, I'm going to stop there because this is not a virology course or even a general biology course. This is a seminar course designed to familiarize you with some basic concepts that will help you understand COVID-19 better. So the take home point of the last couple of minutes is that SARS-CoV-2 is a single stranded RNA virus that cannot integrate itself into our DNA genome. 
It does, however, utilize the protein synthesizing machinery within uh, humans to replicate itself. Now, that leads us to an important conversation about the structure of SARS-CoV-2. By now, you've all seen cartoony looking images of this virus. Some of you have maybe even seen an electron micrograph of a SARS-CoV-2 virion. In either case, you're probably aware of the famous spike protein that gives coronaviruses its name because it, well, looks a little bit like a crown. Let's take a few minutes to label and describe the different structures on the entire SARS-CoV-2 virion. So basically, SARS-CoV-2 has four structural proteins, as well as several non-structural proteins, such as RNA polymerase and other enzymes. Now, remember earlier when I said that some viruses don't have polymerases? Well, as I just mentioned, SARS-CoV-2 does carry its own code for making those enzymes. Before we talk about those proteins, let's talk about the spherical portion of the virion. By the way, virion is a term that we use for the complete virus particle before it enters a cell. So I just realized that I was introducing a new term and, and I hadn't defined it for you. So, so there you go. The, the spherical part of the SARS-CoV-2 virion, in other words, the, the basketball looking part, the, the sphere of the virion is called the cell membrane. Now, the cell membrane is a double layer, or as we call it, it's a bilayer. In fact, to be more specific, the outermost layer is a, a series of tightly packed phosphate heads. Now, the inner layer of the bilayer is also made of those same phosphate heads. Now, between those two bilayers um, are uh, substances called lipids or fats. These lipids look like tails coming off of the heads of the phosphate. So, the bilayer is made up of phospholipids. So, you take phosphate and lipids and you cram them together and they're called phospholipids, which is why we call it a phospholipid bilayer, where the phosphate heads form the layers and the lipid tails hang out in between those two layers. Now, incidentally, this type of phospholipid bilayer is sensitive to soaps and detergent, which is why the public has been so strongly encouraged to be vigilant about hand washing. But let's not digress. Let's get on to our four structural proteins. So the M protein, as in membrane protein, is abundant in the virion and is integrated into that phospholipid bilayer. The M protein serves to protect the virion from our immune system through a couple of different mechanisms. And so the M protein is most certainly a target of investigation by drug researchers, because if we can modify that in protein, then maybe it won't be able to protect itself from our immune system as well. The next uh, structural protein we'll talk about, this is number two, is the E protein or the envelope protein or envelope, depending on where you're from. This is also embedded in the bilayer. The E protein is largely responsible for the cytotoxicity of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. It also helps with viral construction and release, which is why it's being heavily investigated as a target for viral therapeutics by pharmaceutical companies. Now, the S protein, which you're all probably very familiar with, or at least uh, familiar with the term, represents the third structural protein, which are spike proteins. Now, these spike proteins are more accurately glycoproteins, which means that it's a protein that has at least one sugar side chain, chain in its structure. Um, the spike proteins are what the virus uses to attach itself to receptors on human cells. Now, you may recall in our central dogma video that we had an example receptor that was called ACE2. Do you remember that receptor? That was our kind of our example in the central dogma video? Well, it wasn't by coincidence that I used ACE2 as an example because uh, 
ACE2 is in fact the receptor that the spike protein attaches to to gain entry into human cells and cause COVID disease. While we can look at the spike protein from a perspective of increasing virulence, however, the upside to that spike protein is that it gives researchers a structure to target in the creation of vaccines. We're going to get to that in a bit. The fourth structural protein is the N protein, or N as in Nancy. Uh, and N, in this case, stands for nucleocapsid protein. Now, the nucleocapsid protein encapsulates or surrounds and interacts with the single-stranded RNA. Remember the nucleic acid, the genetic code of the virus? It, it encapsulates and interacts with that to protect it inside the virion so that it will be able to replicate. Now, you may have noticed that I said the word protein a lot in my structural description of SARS-CoV-2, right? The reason for that is because the virion is basically multiple layers of proteins that enclose ssRNA. And as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, scientists have the ability to target these proteins based upon their structure. We can use various laboratory techniques to determine the size, the shape, and the sequence of these proteins. When we have that information, we can figure out ways to interact with those proteins that make up these virion structures. So we'll stop there because I want to give you time to digest this information. But we're going to meet in the next video where we're going to talk about viral variants.